Hi, this class is about safety. The other day a friend of mine, Jimmy, while he was at work, he was working inside of a hot panel. He ended up getting hurt that day. And this is what he told me happened. He said while he was working inside of that hot panel, he was really thinking a lot about what was going to happen when he got home. Because he really couldn't wait to get off work. He wanted to go home and see his wife and kids. Well, then he got to thinking, you know, his wife's probably going to leave and then want him to watch the kids. And he started to get upset because he really didn't want to do that. He'd been working hard all day and really kind of wanted to go home and relax. Well, the more he thought about it, the more he got upset. And the more upset he got about it, the less he was watching what he was doing. And before you know it, he showed it out that way. Well, for Jimmy, he didn't have to go home that night and take care of the kids. Well, that was because he ended up spending the night in the hospital. I'm thinking... Jimmy probably wishes he would have been mentally there instead of thinking about what was going on at home. You know, that is probably one of the number one safety tips that you can take with you everywhere you go, whether that's driving a car, uh, doing anything at home, and especially being at work. Be mentally there. The other thing that Jimmy could have done was made sure that he was wearing his personal protective equipment. We're going to call that PPE for short. What he could have been wearing was safety glasses, a face shield, hot gloves, and maybe an arc flash suit. The NFPA 70E manual goes into what we need to wear when we're working on live equipment. That is something that you can start checking out and seeing what you might need while you're at work. A short circuit in a panel can be in excess of 22,000 amps. That, that's a lot of amps, 22,000. You know, I can hear some of you saying that, well, my panel is only 200 amps, so I don't need to worry about that. Well, in all reality, you do, because you can easily come up with 22,000 amps or more in a short circuit in any panel. We will go over that in a different class later on in the quarter. Also, when you cause that short circuit, that copper inside of that panel, it expands to 67,000 times its original size. So when it goes from a solid to a vapor, it expands quickly in just milliseconds. That's what causes the explosion. Not only does it explode like that, it actually reaches temperatures that are four times hotter than the sun. That's pretty hot. And no sunscreen is not going to help in that instance. Let me give you a safety tip from OSHA. OSHA states that you are not to wear any conductive clothing or articles of jewelry while working on anything live. That includes rings and bracelets, watches, and most of all, orthodontic headgear. My personal tip is to stand beside a disconnect when you are going to turn it on. Why? Well, first of all, it actually freaks people out, which to me is kind of funny, because they actually think you don't know what you're doing. But in reality, you do know what you're doing, because by standing in front of a disconnect, if there happens to be trouble on the other side of that disconnect where it's connected to, it could explode. And you don't want to be standing in front of it if it were to explode. 
So by standing beside of it, it keeps you from picking molten metal pieces out of your face for weeks. Now, there may come a time when you come across somebody who has been hurt in the electrical field. And they might be electrocuted. So what do you do if somebody's been electrocuted? Well, OSHA defines electrocution as death due to severe shock. So that means that they are dead. You got to call the morgue. But more often than not, you're going to come across somebody who's been shocked and possibly severely shocked. In those cases, they may not see any injury right away, but they may have something going on inside. One of the other things that you might notice is they could be burned whether in one little spot or possibly all over their body, depending on how large the explosion was. There's another thing that can happen when somebody gets severely shocked that sometimes we don't think about, and that's secondary injuries. Those secondary injuries could be something like falling off a ladder. So this is where your first aid training should kick in. You do have first aid training, right? Well, I'll tell you what, you need to do what you can do and then let the professionals do what they do. But most importantly, call 911. There's one piece of gear that you as an electrician should have in your personal protective equipment arsenal. What is it? It's a good meter. I know sometimes we don't think about meters as being part of our protective equipment, but what can it do for you? Well, the first thing it can do is tell you if something is live or not. And that's really important because you know that we are never to work on anything that is live, especially as an apprentice. There are times when we do have to work on things that are live, and if we do that, we need to make sure that we have plenty of supervision and that we are wearing the correct PPE. We also need to take every precaution necessary to make sure that ourselves as well as those around us and equipment doesn't have any problems after we're through. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, you know, meters are kind of expensive and I carry a volt pen, so I don't really need a meter. Well, to that, I'm going to say, if that's what you're doing, throw the volt pen away. Y yeah, really, throw it away. I, I personally own a volt pen and a volt pen has got me into trouble more times than I can really think about it. I began to rely on a volt pen a lot when it came to troubleshooting and I found out that it was definitely not a very reliable means of telling if something is truly live or not. The first instruction inside of a volt pen box says you need to test on a known live circuit first. Well, do you do that? Because I never used to do that. If you do do that, I, I'm grateful. I think that's, that's really cool. But more often than not, probably you grab it out of your pocket and you use it to see if something's hot. So if you're going to use a volt pen, be really, really careful. Well, back to meters. You know, one thing that I've learned teaching this class was that you could actually test to see if a switch was live or not by just testing across the two screws of the switch. Now, in theory, that does work, but there are a couple ways that you will not be able to get a good reading. What are they? Well, I'd like for you to figure it out and then bring that to the next class, and that's another thing that we will discuss. Now, I use what is called a voltmeter for probably 95% of everything that I need to test or troubleshoot. Why a voltmeter? because it's pretty handy and it's actually pretty rugged compared to a lot of the other meters out there. 
The first malt meter that I ever had was called a Wiggy. And in the trade, a lot of guys, at least in my generation, have always called volt meters a Wiggy. I really don't know why it's called a Wiggy. We just call it that. But if you would get on Google and look it up, I'm sure you could find out why it's called a Wiggy. I would like to know myself, so if you would bring that to the next class, that would be really great, and we can discuss it then. What a voltmeter does is give you an approximate voltage and not an exact voltage. And a lot of the voltmeters today read continuity, and that's why they're good for troubleshooting, because most of the time those are the only two things that you ever really need. These are great meters to keep in your pouch. Now what about your digital voltmeter? Well, what about it? Do you have one? I do. Why don't you ask me about mine? And in the process, why don't you look at your meter before the next class and tell me what category your meter is in. What? You didn't know your meter had categories? Certainly they do. What are the categories? Well, why don't you look them up and find out and also bring that to class? because that'd be another great topic for us to discuss in class next time. Well, what about education? Did you realize that by coming to school and getting educated on the hows and whys of what you're doing is actually part of the safety process? By getting educated and understanding your trade, you are actually becoming a safer and more responsible employee. In today's trades, you really need to have an advantage over everybody else in the field, and this will be your advantage. I have lots of really, really good stories to tell about safety. Some are good and some ended up not so well. Ask me about those and I would be sure happy to go over those with you in class. There is one safety rule that I want you to never forget. And that safety rule is this. There is no one more responsible for your safety than you. I'll see you in next class. Be safe.